Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews with NP Strategy here in the studio today with Nexon Pruitt healthcare attorney Matthew Roberts. Matthew, good to be with you. Good to see you. Thank you. We are honored to have with us joining today is Dr. Marjorie Jenkins. She is the dean of the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Greenville and the chief academic officer for Prisma Health in the Upstate. Dr. Jenkins, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Heather. I'm delighted to be here. Hi, Matthew. Hey, good to see you. It is hard for me to believe that it has been 10 years since the School of Medicine Greenville was established in partnership with Prisma. And I remember I was a you know working journal, former working journalist that you were trying to address the shortfalls in physicians shortages there, and then just provide better health care opportunities in the upstate Dr. Jenkins, can you just think back over the last decade and and share some of the high points of what's been accomplished and how it's impacted the region? I'm happy to do that. You know, I really can't take credit for most of this. That's under the um, amazing partnership with the flagship and Prisma Health, then Greenville Health System. Um, Also from the people who founded this school and really stood it up and grew such an amazing school so that I would have this opportunity to be here. Um, I really love this school. I love the story and the background. Um, And I will say that, as you said, as you mentioned, Heather, there is a real need for more physicians in South Carolina. We're 800 primary care doctors short in 2025. Um, So we did want to really develop more physicians for South Carolina. We also wanted to create um, and develop a different kind of physician. Uh, Healthcare, when I started in practice, uh, was vastly different than the complexity, the trillion dollar industry that it is today. And our physicians of today need to understand the business of medicine, as well as community health and population health and big data that we can utilize to help create healthier populations. So this school has really achieved that. We are known nationally and internationally as an innovator in medical education. We have a very unique relationship with Prisma Health, which uh, is, a, as you know, a healthcare system that now covers two thirds of South Carolina. 1,100 Prisma Health physicians are our faculty. Um, are our clinical faculty, and that creates just this amazing environment to educate our students and the future physicians for South Carolina. Well, Greenville is a great town. Uh, it's one of the best towns in the state. Uh, how successful have you been to, to getting your students to stay in, in Greenville after they, they graduate from medical school? Well, developing physicians is a long pipeline, right? They graduate from undergraduate. There's four years of medical school, three to six or seven years of residency, depending on what you choose to train in. And we have our charter class who are now practicing primary care um, that would have done a three-year residency. And we know that almost half of those primary care physicians are practicing in South Carolina. That's great. The fun thing that we're seeing, Matthew, is that uh, even as students have left to uh, train in residency, we ha- are recruiting them back. back so right. That's, again, that partnership with Prisma Health, and they want to recruit our students back. Also, residency programs that get our students <clears throat> want more of our students. So right. we have a really awesome reputation for developing great physicians and clinicians. And as you mentioned, that recruitment pro- process can take, I mean, years I mean, it's not just, you know, you put out an ad, you're tracking people through their programs and it takes a while for that to go through, obviously, and then and hopefully are successful in getting them to come back. So that's outstanding. And we are we are seeing that. Sorry, Heather. Oh, no, you no, please. I was just wanting to turn us. You got me thinking about people and more people and different kinds of people. And uh, let's talk about diversity and representation of healthcare professionals more diverse population of healthcare professionals, research shows that increases patient outcomes and your school is, is, has efforts focused on that. One of them is the Levi S. Kirkland Society Mentoring Program. Talk about that and anything else that you're doing there. 
Happy to. Well, I'll start out by saying we are the most diverse medical school in South Carolina. We have 23% uh, underrepresented in medicine students across our 432 students. We also have uh, almost 70% of our students have at least one demographic uh, diversity metric that we look at, like rurality, uh, low socioeconomic status, uh, of course, race, ethnicity, et cetera. And so we have really put, but that doesn't happen by chance, right? So you're you're correct. We have really put resources and efforts into developing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at, at our medical school. And the Levi S. Kirkland Society is a group of underrepresented physicians within Prisma Health. That is a society that has partnered with the medical school for several years, many years, to actually help us recruit underrepresented students. So they will call students uh, once they're accepted to our medical school, encouraging them to come into Greenville uh, to the School of Medicine. They will meet with them. Uh, they mentor them once they're here. So it's a really lovely relationship. It has allowed us to, and to welcome historically diverse classes for the last three years. Uh, we have 25% or more of our last three year classes are underrepresented in medicine. Wow. And talking about just a little bit of numbers and success, our medical school received almost 5,000 applications last year for our 100 to 105 seats in the class. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about this for those of us who work in the healthcare space? <clears throat> we understand that you could have all the applicants you want, but you've got to have spaces for them uh, in terms of, you know, the, the residency programs and everything else. So there are natural limitations on the number of students you can uh, accept, even though there is a physician shortage. Correct. So, Matthew, each school is approved for a certain number of students. Right. For instance, right now we can uh, accept up to a maximum of 110. We are increasing that class size over the next few years to 125. Right. So we'll have a cohort of 500 um, students. But what has happened, you are correct, there was a 20 year um, dearth where medical schools, new medical schools were not being formed. And that was from a double AMC uh, report that said we had a glut of physicians and we did not need any more physicians. And then we had another report that said, oh my goodness, we are going to be 50 to 100,000 physicians short. And that caused new medical schools to begin to open. And we were one of the first. And what has happened is that as we started new medical schools, now in the double digits, we have not increased residency positions accordingly across the country. Now that is related to a, a cap by a federal government cap for funding for post uh, medical school training. Um, and so you actually have in the US around 7,000 students that will graduate without having a position to train in because we we have that discrepancy now within medical students and residency slots for them yeah. to train into. Yeah, that's that's probably not well known by mm -mm, most folks outside the healthcare industry, and it's a it's a little a little curious as to how the federal government allows that to happen. So. Well, um, they actually support primary care residencies right. and rural primary care in a really um, intentional way, and we appreciate that. But we do need to look at um, a new model and in increasing uh, postgraduate training. Uh, can I just drop a little bit of data about your medical school here in Greenville? Please uh, do. We have a 99.5% match rate. Um, for our students across uh, since our inaugural class graduated in 2016. That's and that's um, compared to a national average of around 95%. Yeah, that's great. That's really good. Um, let me move to a new topic. Root Cause is a health and public service initiative led by the School of Medicine in Greenville, uh, along with other community partners that serves the residents in the community of Dunneen who have limited access to health care. Can you talk about the growth of this program and the impact it has had both on medical students and the community it serves? I am so happy to brag about this program. It is student initiated. So one of our, uh, the residents at Prisma, it's a partnership with Prisma Health. It was all School of Medicine Greenville alumni, physician, uh, resident, and our students 
that came together. They looked at the needs assessment, the community health needs assessment. Um, they also looked at a Furman needs assessment for the community health. We knew that South Carolina in 2019 was rated the 43rd unhealthiest state in the country, and that prompted the um, development of root cause. Since that time in the community of Dunning, um, we have had 45 community groups partner with Root Cause. We've had wow. we've touched over 500 community residents um, in giving them access to healthy meals, referral to primary care, blood pressure screenings, um, information about um, opioid use, information about vaccinations, et cetera. Over 600 medical students have volunteered wow. over the past three years for this program. And I am so excited to share with you that we recently received a, a fairly sizable healthy Greenville grant to expand root cause to the communities of Berea and Nickeltown. Wow. So we That's will great. be, this is a very, very scalable model for community health. And I think in the future, we will have a conversation, hopefully, that where this is a national model. Well, it's, it's such a great example of how medical school is moving outside of the classroom. Medical schools are moving outside of the classroom, and you're, you're a leader in that initiative. So that's that's terrific. And that's what young people want. Yeah. They want to be right. connected. Yeah, exactly. They want experiences. And we, um, you know, we start that so early with our students. And we can talk about that a little bit if you'd like around our EMT program. That would be great. And if you would also um, share when you talk about the EMT program about the research partnership that you have with USC Prisma, because that's another experience that would be, um, you know, really valuable for, to a medical student. Love to. Uh, we had, we were the first to have a EMT training program where our first year medical students come to Greenville six weeks early for their first year of coursework to train right on the ambulances and become South Carolina certified EMTs. That takes hundreds of hours of riding on the ambulance. We also require them to have the national certification. I believe we're the only medical school in the country that requires that. Because of that, because of that program, which allows our students to get connected right immediately to the community, they're able to see where people live, where people will be discharged back to. Um, and that has been so helpful in creating not only competent clinicians, but clinicians who are kind and with empathy for, uh, you know, maybe someone with an opioid uh, overdose and looking to, to see where they'll be going back to. And one right. of my students actually told me that they had a very different opinion about opioid use disorder before their EMT experience. So that has been um, a, a really wonderful um, partnership with Prisma, the Greenville County um, EMS. And we also, um, for that, for the EMT program, they continue to ride on the ambulance rides in their first and second years as well. Wow, what, great, what a great experience for them. Uh, because they were, because Matthew, because they were certified, our students were able to help um, provide vaccinations during the COVID pandemic because they were already certified EMT. So they were qualified to do that. Well, you, you know, you have this, this specialization of physicians, as we've seen over the last 20 years. So where, you know, if you talk to a physician, you ask them about some other medical issue, they say, well, I only do X. <laughs> And so it's the, it, I, I love the concept of connection to the basic health care needs and to the communities. That's a great combination. And Heather, I did uh, remember your uh, question about research. So um, research, I think for all students is an experience they should have access to. So that was one of the major initiatives when I came on board in 2019, was increasing the number of our students that are participating in research. They tend to do that after their first year, between first and second year. That's the only summer that they have, quote, out of, uh, out of school um, in their four years. And we started out with about 60% um, prior to my joining performing research, and we're now at 95%. So we have over 100 students 
participating in research this past year. We have developed, we have also created stipends for our students. As you know, medical students, medical school is expensive. Students leave with six-figure debt. So we wanted to allow them the opportunity to stay in the summer and do research, not have to go out and get a job during the summer. And um, they've performed some really great uh, projects that are wow. directly related to the community. Things such as uh, depression in adolescents, uh, opioid use and attitudes in Appalachian populations. They've looked at social determinants in certain zip codes and how that impacts healthcare outcomes and access. Um, they are they are hungry to be critical thinkers and to we we tell them to ask the questions that we need to know today to help create a healthier community for South Carolinians. And they are really, um, they've really taken that charge and just really done a great job with it. Wow. That, that blesses both the student and the community. Absolutely. And yeah. let's not forget that 80% of those projects are, are mentored and precepted by clinicians at Prisma Health who are also our clinical faculty. So without this great partnership with the flagship and Prisma, and what we have to bring together, um, many of these, as we've talked about already, would not be possible. Right. Well, this next issue is important and it hits close to home for me. Um, so the, the USC School of Medicine Greenville is the first, USC, uh, first U.S. medical school to fully incorporate education in nutrition, physical activity, behavior change, and self-care into all four years of the medical school curriculum. Now, this is important, and, this, and first, kudos for doing that, because we know physi being a physician, as you know, is a very difficult job. It's tough on you physically, mentally, emotionally. I'm married to a physician. It's a stressful job. You guys work a lot. Uh, talk a little bit about this program, what it's designed to do to help make physicians healthier as they move into their professional lives. You know, that's our lifestyle medicine program. And the uh, your listeners may be hearing about lifestyle medicine because it's starting to get some traction within Congress about uh, a house resolution was just passed that we should treat uh, teach nutrition in medical schools. Right. Um, New York City just put forty four million dollars into training every provider in lifestyle medicine. So we really are the national and international leaders in lifestyle medicine. We incorporated that through Dr. Jennifer Trilk's leadership um, at the very beginning of this school. And I think it was really um, very visionary for the school to do that. Um, we have it, it really lifestyle medicine is good preventative health. Right. I mean, it basically says, you know, exercise, uh, get enough sleep, lower your stress, don't smoke, um, good nutrition. We teach culinary medicine here. People don't often think about food as medicine. We don't think about exercise as a prescription, but right. we also have exercise as medicine Greenville, where we work with clinicians to prescribe exercise. N none of my physicians have ever prescribed exercise <laughs> for me. I don't know if they've done that for you, um, but we've, we're starting to see the impacts of this program, not just for our students, but also in the outcomes of uh, patients uh, within Prisma, lower blood pressure, lower blood sugar. Those oh. are two major risk factors for the number one killer of South Carolinians, which are stroke and heart disease. Right. So mm -hmm. connecting that education all the way through to the community health has really been a beautiful thing to see develop here. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. I mean, it's, it's surprising that it's not been done more often when you hear that you're the first to do it, so. Well, you know, I wanna brag a little bit about our school as I've done during this podcast, yeah. but um, we also packaged our curriculum resources and we open source them to the world. And we've done that over the last couple of years. We've now had 600 downloads across the world, hundreds of medical schools and over 50 countries have wow. downloaded our materials. Wow. And as they're they're practicing what they preach, hopefully as they learn this, what are you helping? How are you helping medical school students deal with the rigors of being a physician long term? Well, I'll use a quote from Dr. Jennifer Trilk of our lifestyle medicine program. She tells students, "You are your first patient. 
uh, when it comes to lifestyle medicine. Now, the medical school itself provides, we have a lot of wraparound services for our students. We have great healthcare services through Prisma Health, a model that we created for the medical school with Prisma. We have um, success coaches. We have career counseling. Um, we have uh, an academic success office, a new office of academic success. Uh, we have a new... Um, counselor that we brought in just for our students to have access to. We do things like yoga. Um, we have uh, lunch and learns around meditation. So all of that, I think one of the things about our students and why they choose to come to Greenville, when we were in COVID that's the summer, and I was a, a dean for about a minute when COVID hit, we actually, um, I met with all of my first year students who were coming in virtually um, by Zoom in groups of three to five. My first question to them was, why did you choose Greenville School of Medicine? And without fail, 90% of them said, because it, you made me feel like I was going to get individualized treatment or um, education, individualized education. Mm -hmm. You made me feel like um, I mattered as a person, as an individual, and it felt like home. Wow. And so that is, and you know, Matthew, that is a culture that has been developed in this medical school that is really special. These classes come in, they are close, they are cohesive, they help support one another. Um, we also give resources to help support them. We want them to get to and through medical school. If we don't do that, then I feel like we have um, not fulfilled our promise to our students. Well said. What a lot accomplished yeah. in one decade. Yes. yes. Again, it's hard to believe it was 10 years yeah. ago, but when you hear all that you've done, then okay, maybe it was yeah, 10 years yes. ago. Dr. Marjorie Jenkins, thank you so much for joining us today. You're Dean of the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Greenville and also Chief Academic Officer at Prisma Health in the Upstate. Uh, continue on the good work and thank you. Will do. Thank you both. Thank you. For those of you joining us today, we hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Jenkins, and we look forward to seeing you next time right here on Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast. <laughs>